In this week's Haftorah portion, we read from the book of Judges, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 through 33. And we know that these Haftorah portions just weren't, they weren't random. It's not like you opened up, they opened up the, the, the book and they said, okay, we're going to read this Torah portion this week and that Torah, and, and this, this Haftorah portion this week, because there was a time where they couldn't study the Torah. So they had uh, these half Torah portions, and when the when they could publicly start studying the Torahs in Judaism, they don't take away; they only add to. So therefore, the half Torah portion never went away, and uh, it's studied along with the portion every week. And um, in this week's half Torah portion of Chukot, we see that the nation of Israel uh, goes into battle with the Amorites in order to uh, conquer the land of Israel. And in this half Torah portion, we see that the nation of Israel is defending the land of Israel. You know, they are uh, protecting it from Ammon, the battle with Ammon. So we see in, in verse 1 of chapter 11, Yiftak, the Gileadite, was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a strange woman. Gilead begot Yiftak, and, Ye and Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when the wife's sons grew up, they drove Yiftak away, away and said to him, You will not inherit the household of our father. You are the son of another woman. It says a lot right there in the first couple verses. You know, it, it identifies who Yiftak is. He was a Gileadite. It identifies that he was a mother of a strange woman. And there's a couple uh, interpretations as to what a strange woman is. As in Rehab, we see that one interpretation was that she was a harlot. You know, there was another interpretation that said she was, at that time, if you were from another tribe, that was considered a strange woman. And that's where most of the commentators are, are leaning towards, that she was from another tribe. Then it identifies Yivdok's father, who is Gilead. So we know who his father is. And then it says Gilead's wife, this would be his Ketubah wife, this would, this would be who is recognized as his wife, bore him two sons. Well, these sons grew up, bore him sons, and these sons grew up kind of uh, feeling a little resentment towards, towards uh, Yifta. You know, they, because he was from another, uh, another woman, not their mother. You know, so the text moves on. It says, Yifta fled because of his brothers and settled in the land of Tob. Boris men collected around Yiftak and ventured forth with him. The land of Tob could be understood on the Peshat level that it was ruled by the land by a man named Tob. And then there's another interpretation that it was just a good land. So over, over a period of time, the children of Ammon who made war, uh, the children of Ammon made war with Israel. And the elders of Gilead went to Yiftak, they went to Tob to, to physically go get him back. You know, they realized they needed a leader. They needed somebody to take them into battle because at that time they, they didn't have any, anybody raising their hand saying, all right, let's go. Who's, let's go ahead and take on, these, uh, take on the children of Ammon. So they go to him and they, say, they, they ask him, they said, come back and be our chief and we will do battle with Ammon. He was like, come back. You're the one who threw me out. You asked me to leave. You hated me. You know, now, now you want me to come back. They said, well, for this we have returned to you. In other words, we're sorry. We understand. Please forgive us. You know, when he was addressing them, he was saying you. Now, in the text before, we see that the sons were the actual reason why he left. There's a couple reasons or interpretation as to why he said you. Either the sons were now a part of these elders that came to visit him to bring him back, or he was saying to the elders, you could have stopped this, but you didn't. You know, you chose not to. So he goes on and they say, he goes on and says, you know, you, 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 know, you asked me to leave. They come back and they tell him, for this we have returned. You know, we're sorry. So we want you to become our leader now over all the inhabitants of, of Gilead. So they first go over to him and say, hey, we need a general. We want you to be our chief. He gives them a little kickback. You know, it's like, wait a second. So then they said, no, 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 wait a second. We want you to be our leader now. 
you know, we want you to be our leader to uh, uh, over all the inhabitants. So Yivtak, he says, well, my being a leader isn't going to be dependent on whether, whatever the outcome is of this war, of this battle. He says, make, in, in words, he says, make me your leader now and I'll go. So in, in verse 9, he goes, Yiptak said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me back to do battle with the children of Ramon, and Hashem delivers them before me, I will become your leader. The elder says, may Hashem bear witness between us if we do not do according to your word. So Yiptak was, he was like, all right, let's go. They took him on back to Gilead, and they, they presented him as their chief and leader of all the inhabitants. So at this point, Yiptak uh, spoke all his words before Hashem and Mitzvah. Now Mitzvah is, is a place that was, uh, where there was, a, it was, there was a miracle there with, in Joshua where Hashem brought these miracles to him. It was Mitzvah, so this place was like sanctified. So Hashem was, he, it, was it was known that Hashem was dwelling there, so he decided this is where I need to say his words. Now his words, there's commentary on his words that says, on the, on the term his words, so this usually implies harsh speech. Now, it says, and this is what they consider harsh speech, it says, I am an ordinary human being who was humiliated and banished by my brothers, but when they pleaded with me to help them, I looked over my grievance and I went with them. Surely Hashem, the eternal king of the source of mercy, should show compassion on them. You know, I read that and it sounded, it sounded a lot like personal prayer. Hibadadut. He took some time and he kind of brought Hashem up to speed on where he's on, on, on the current events. We know Hashem, he knows, he knows all. But it's important for us to pour our hearts out to him and bring him to speed. You bring him up to speed on, on what's going on. So that's what he decided to do as soon as he got into the land. He did that first. Now he's got a war to fight. He's got a battle to fight. So what's the, thing he, what's the first thing he does? Yiftak sends emissaries to the king of the children of Iman saying, what is there between you and me that you have come to me to make war in my land? You know, he says, why? Why, why are you coming here? The king sends a message back. He says, and it's a lot like the, you, you'll hear this a lot today. And the, the king of the children of Amman said to Yitzvah Kemeseres, because Israel took away my land. It took away my, I was, I was like, are you, it sounded a lot like what we hear today. You know, and, and when it ascended from Egypt and Amman and, and from Arnon to the Jabbok to the Jordan. So now return them in peace. Although another phrase, also another phrase that we hear today. So this was the message that you thought got back from the king. Right off the bat, he goes, okay, need to fix this. Obviously your your views are a little distorted. Your boundaries are a little exaggerated. So he sends emissaries back and said to him, Israel did not take away any land of Moab, and on the land, any, Israel did not take away the land of Moab and the land of the children of Ammon. For when they ascended from Egypt, Israel went in the wilderness until the Sea of Reeds, and then they arrived in Kadesh. Now that's, a, that's how he starts off his conversation. This 40-year span of what actually happened, he starts off with the Sea of Reeds. It's kind of funny that he's, he started off with that because the Sea of Reeds, this is where this huge miraculous event happened. You know, he's telling him, hey, look, you're just not dealing with the Jewish chieftain right now. You're dealing with the master of the universe. You know, that's the first thing he told him. And then he ends with, and they arrived in Kadesh, which is where they settled just prior to going into the land. And then he follows on with this saying, Israel sent emissaries to the king of Edom. 
he, he proceeds saying, uh, it's sent also to the king of Moab. Then in verse 19, then Israel sent emissaries to Sihon, the king of the Amorite, the king of the Amorite, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, let us now pass through your land until my place. They were instructed not to mess with the um, uh, Ammon. They were instructed not to. So they're sending emissaries in. And he's ex clearly explaining this to them. He goes on to say in verse 20, But Sihon did not trust Israel to pass through his border. Rather, Sihon assembled his entire people, and they encamped at Jahaz, and he made war against Israel. You know, it's very much exactly like what the king of Ammon is doing right now. You know, he gathered his people, he encamped right there, and he's ready to make war to him. And then he follows it up with the very next sentence, Then Hashem, God of Israel, delivered Sihon and his entire people into the, land, into the hand of Israel. So just another reminder. So I was reading this text, and it was just reminder after reminder after reminder, you know, on what actually is happening and what's going to happen. You know, um, we follow this in verse 22 is they took possession of the entire territory and the and the Amorite from Arnon to the Jabbok and from the and from the wilderness of Jordan so now he says Hashem the God of Israel has driven out the Amorite because of his because of his people Israel yet you would possesses it surely whatever your God Homesh will let you possess, possesses, and that you shall possesses, and whichever people God has driven away from befo away before us, that the land we shall possess. And now you are, he says, and now are you any better than Balak, son of Behor, the king of Moab? Did he pursue any grievance against Israel, or did he make any war against them? You know, he just wanted to give him some kind of comparison. And he used... He he made reference to um, their idol that they were that they were idling or that they were had at that time Homesh. You know, very similar to um, Balaam, who Balak could, you know had reached out to. So it says while Israel dwelt, and then he and then he finished with this. It says while Israel dwelt in Hezbon and its suburbs in Aror and its suburbs. And in all the cities that are near are known for 300 years. Why did you not come then? Why didn't anybody come and address us then? If this is your land, why didn't they take it then? Why is it now that you are coming here to take it? So the king's response was like, he says, no. He says, he says uh, but the king of the children of Ammon did not heed the words of Japheth, of Yitzhak, Yitz, <laughs> Yitzhak, sorry, which he sent to him. So a spirit of Hashem was upon Yutak, and he passed through the Gilead and Manasseh, and he passed through Mizpeh of Gilead, and from Mizpeh of Gilead he passed through to the children of Ammon. Commentaries say that they give this route that he took. There's two. There's two views on it. Either this is where this is where they trekked to set up on the Jordan to get ready. But they also said that they went through there because they also had um, people of Amman were camped in there and they had to like weed them out, you know, weed them out as but just before they went to battle. So at this point, this is I guess the the vow, the vow that Yiptak took. So Yiptak declared a vow to Hashem and said, "If you will indeed deliver the children of Amman into my hand, then it shall be whatever emerges." What will emerge from the front doors of my house toward me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon? It shall belong to Hashem, and I shall offer it up as an elevation offering. You know, we've all learned in the past, you know, there's, there's enough that we need that we already have. If what we, the limitations that we can choose to put on ourselves, taking on these extra vows. Um, he didn't have to. He could have easily just prayed to Hashem. And ask for victory. He chose to bring something to the table. There's a lot of commentaries. There's it's exhaustive. There was a lot of resources that I that I couldn't even get into. But he said, but the commentary says he had no idea what was going to be the first thing 
that, that, that he was to see when, when he came back to the land. It could have been something that he couldn't offer. You know, it could have, uh, it could have been anything. So how was he to know? How could he make that statement? And we learn later on, the very first thing that he saw was his daughter rejoicing as he returned to the land. And uh, in Perkei Avot chapter 2, it says the mark of a wise man is that, is that he sees what will develop. And that's, you know, that's a, it's hard to get, you know, you get caught up in a moment and you start seeing all these things and, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to take from that, a lot to understand from that. So he makes this vow. And then in verse 32, it says, Then Yiptar crossed, in, crossed to the children of Ammon to do battle against them, and Hashem once again delivered them into, into his hand. The very last verse of the, of the Haftar says, He struck them from Aurora until, until your approach to the minute, 20 cities, and until the plain of Cherimim. A very great blow, and the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. That ends the half Torah portion, but then it goes on in, in the, for the rest of the chapter to say uh, about the daughter. He had an option. He didn't need to. He didn't need to go ahead and follow through with his vow. He he figured he was at such a standing. Commentaries say there's a there's a view that he was at such a standing. He felt like um, he had to stick to this vow. At that time, there was there was no uh, uh, sacrificing of humans was was forbidden. Some say that Pinhas, at the currently he was at this time he was a Kohen Gadol and he could have stepped in, but pride got in his way. He said, "No, he should come to me. I shouldn't have to go to him and let him know he doesn't have to follow through with this vow." And he and 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 Yiftak at that time he was saying, "What well, commentaries say that he was saying the same thing." You know, um, there's others that say that uh, to follow through with this vow, what he did. What he did was he built a place for her up in the mountains, and she went to go stay there um, for about, in the, with the exception of about four days a year, when they, you know, were going to uh, come out and pray about it. Um, that's the, I guess, the, the the most common understanding of what happened. You couldn't imagine that he actually followed through with this vow to sacrifice his daughter because it was the very first thing that she's seen. You know, in this half Torah portion, I. Uh, there's one thing that seems to, to stand out, you know, he, he didn't take, he didn't give any kind of praise to anybody other than Hashem. When he was talking, re, when he was recounting the events in, that happened in the land, he didn't say that Moses did all this, he said Hashem did it all. Hashem brought the victory. Hashem brought the victory, you know, in his hands with here. He, it, the, as soon as he gets into the land, what's he do? He's, he... He, um, uh, he talks to Hashem, makes his vow with Hashem. You know, it's, I think we constantly need to check ourselves. You know, when something goes wrong, who are we? Who are we praying to? Are we, whose hands are we putting it in? You know, are we taking it to Hashem? Are we taking it to the field and giving it to Him? Are we, are, are, are we trying to figure it out? Are we trying to make sense of whatever it is that we're going through? And says, oh, no, I've got to fix this, you know. I, he, he helped me last week, you know. No, no, we've got to take it to Hashem all the time. 